I, I, okay, we, we have Marcelo. I actually would like to ask a, uh, a question I intended to ask you, Ana Marta, before, and then I have a question for you also. So I'll just, the, um, I think you, you, you explained nicely that uh, uh, love does not require perfect knowledge. But there is this whole tradition that love is a vehicle, a means of gaining knowledge. And especially interpersonal relationships. Uh, like I have a daughter who's a, uh, a jazz singer. She also does uh, pop. And I, I've gotten interested in and learned about, you know, a field that I, I really knew nothing about. So just by my, from my affection for her, you know. But anyway, I just wish you, I wonder if you could comment on that love as a, as a means of knowledge. Uh, and there's another side to it uh, that Thomas Aquinas says that to love someone else, you need not share the same opinion. That the disagreement, on, on, at least of some sorts, is not incompatible with love um, and friendship. And then my, my question for, for you was the, um, as I think it's very important to highlight the loneliness as a, as a really big, uh, it's, it's a major uh, issue in modern life, maybe even a crisis. Um, but it, some, and it, some, but some people are lonely because they don't have family or they're estranged from their families. And, but other people are lonely because they choose to be. I, I, it, sounds, it sounds odd, but I, you know, I, through experience in my own family setting, I, I know someone who complains about being alone, feeling isolated, um, but she does nothing but push other people away. So, so there is, there, there is a, there, it's not just that people don't have the connections. Some people don't know how to, I don't know, avail themselves of the connections they could have. So that's, I wonder what you, you might what you think about that. Thank you, Greg. Uh, well, there is a book by Martha Nussbaum uh, called uh, Love's Knowledge, and she explores the idea that love is also a vehicle of uh, knowledge. Well, um, it's true because love creates a certain connaturality, and then there is room for what Aquinas uh, names at some point, judgment of connaturality, uh, which is, I think it's in the uh, 21st question in our, I don't remember the article, the prima pars. Um, well, and then, uh, as to the, there, there is no need of uh, um, the same, having the same opinion uh, in order to have friendship, this is already in Aristotle in, in, when, when he speaks about um, uh, civic friendship in, in the chapter 11 of uh, book 9 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Of course, you need um, a, to share the basics, but the basics are very little. You, you, there, there is no need of complete uh, agreement in everything only those things that uh, constitute the, the relationship. For instance, at the political level, the constitution, you, you, you need to share the constitution, so to speak, in order to, 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 to coexist uh, politically. And friends need to, to, to uh, be one mind in what regards to the essence of their friendship, the issue that gave place to the friendship. Uh, for instance, if we become friends because of our, um, uh, um, you know, um, because we both like uh, butterflies, uh, of course, we need to share our, uh, uh, like our, our um, taste for butterflies. Otherwise, uh, our friendship disappears. So this is the, but apart from that, uh, well, we, we would need more 
details, but I think that's the basic for now. You know, we have, our societies are becoming more polarized, but people don't hear opinions other than themselves because you're in, a, you're in your own bubble. So I'm starting to wonder whether the family is one of the few remaining places where you might hear a diversity of opinions and be inclined to listen to them uh, because of the affection one has for those, you know, those around one. So thank you for your question. Um, just to make sure I heard it correctly, and the person, him or herself, complains or laments about being left alone, or, or the person. Oh, yours. You're, you're okay. There, there we are. Now I'm talking to that. Is that the the person is is responds hostily to all approaches, comes with barbs and 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 you know these sort of you know constant stream of ironic comments, inappropriate comments. So what happens is and and never takes any initiative to, to gather people. So and the expectation is always on other people. So, I don't, so my my only point is that there are, loneliness has different facets. There are some people who, who who lack the connections through no fault of their own, but then there's always the possibility that someone lacks not in having the connections because of of fault, you know. And well, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I also talked about mercy, and I think. I don't know about this person, whether it's elderly or not, sometimes when old age and certain types of decline set in, that inhibition isn't so well, you know, people can be very blunt without intending to be mean, but they come across slightly <laughs> direct. Yeah. But there is a fact, nobody can undo the bond of a family. And to tell a person Honestly, and there's nothing wrong about truth. Yeah, if it's you know, if it's if it's a benevolent truth, yeah, it's like saying I like you, but I maybe even love you, but your behavior I do not like. And there's a huge difference to be made between how we behave and who we are. Number one. There's secondly a huge difference between what we expect from others, and I think skip it better. But we can hope for the behavior, you know, that the other is behaving in this and that way. But I'm not idealizing family problems, and yet I think there comes a point when the psychologist has to step back and say, look, and the rest is a question of maturity. So to accept and to live with the fact that life is not only about you know, feeling fine and family life is not only ideal. There are many problems. And I think if... Um, I see you want to say something. I, I will come back to you. But I think if there's an honest message, also the church can give. If, if we enter, if the church enters a dialogue yeah, and tries to do so in a secular society, then I think loneliness would be something where the church or representatives of the church can say, we hear your needs. We hear what you are looking for. And we understand it because our, our mindset, our anthropolo anthropology, you know, has an explanation for this. Um, we are we are relational beings, yeah. And mm -hmm. but that once again, if if we paint this ideal, it, it shouldn't come with the force that everything is fine because in this world nothing is fine. It's incomplete. It needs salvation. I'm sorry, it, it, I can't put it differently. Yeah, we are incomplete. No matter what we do, helping professions, we can we can help and we can. We can try to, to erect those who are hurting and who are falling down. It will never be a perfection. And that's, to a certain degree, that's also the reason for our dignity, because we are incomplete. We, ha we are to be completed. Yeah? We can maybe talk about it a bit more <laughs> later. I wonder if I can add a little bit also a family therapy perspective. <laughs> I'm sorry. I complete, I'm in agreement with my colleague 100%. But um, 
um, the way we look at you know those behaviors usually is that we all exercise many defense mechanisms that disconnect us from our most basic needs that always come down to uh, a need for belongingness, feeling loved, feeling appreciated. And um, when we face behaviors like the ones you were describing, there's always a sort of message embedded in that. Of course, there comes a moment in which people may decide up to what extent they want to explore that. But I think it's our collective of responsibility to uh, listen to those messages as much as we can. But I think that in today's society that has become increasingly difficult, uh, our defense mechanisms have been strengthened to incredible points where we got lost into who we are when we interact with one another. And I think that's beginning, used to happen only in public spheres and now it's beginning to happen more and more in the context of intimate relationships in families. And that's scary because it means that there are few places where we can truly connect with ourselves. Uh, that's my opinion at least. Uh, I come back to my question in a different form. <laughs> so, and my question is, uh, for, for, for both, really I want to ask to Boutillone, but it, it's the same. Uh, for you, it's also a good question, especially for, for Alexander. Uh, what is the idea in psychology about prayer, prayer? Because, you know, it's many repetition of the Pope Francis that say, for example, when the family prays together, they stay together. It's necessary to pray together. Well, what is this for psychology? And what is the, the, the meaning of it? And what is the consequence of this? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, there are two answers. I've got a personal conviction. I'm a believing person, and we as a family pray, not in order to stay together, but just because we think it's <laughs> it's what you do if you believe, you know, and many aspects more you want to teach your children. And yet, I should quote, I, I mentioned Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a very faithful, he was a believer, especially after he was released from the concentration camp. That's really when his faith started, yeah, or it started there. Yeah. Uh, and he took, and I think many, one of the reasons why, the, why many people of the church, including Pius VI, did very much like Frankl was that he knew where the limits of psychology are. Now, if you are a reductionist, in other words, if you try, you, and as a psychologist, it's very easy to take each and every human behavior, art, prayer, love, whatever, it's always in the mind, and then you can say, I am responsible, I can explain it to you. Yeah? And yet, um, a non-reductionist, or let's say, a psychologist who accepts human dignity, accepts their limits to his or her expertise. So the psychologist, the most he or she can do is to say, I'm not responsible because I ca I'm not a theologian. I can't answer this question. Yeah, but I hope. I mean, it it may sound like a very you know minor or modest answer. I think it's more a humble answer in the sense of yes, we agree that we are not responsible. It's not our area. How could we be experts? And why are we not experts? To think a little further, because it's not a monologue. Yeah, if it was a monologue, inner thinking, you know, th thought processes, mm -hmm. we study in psychology, and there's no nobody would ever say we're not responsible for this. Yeah, but precisely because um, at least my school, where I come from, accepts that this is a dialogue. But what can I say about mm -hmm. the other? Yeah, so therefore, we have here in the Academy of Sciences a very famous neuro neurologist. Think, uh, world thinker, maybe, maybe you know because a German. And he was very impressed when he go to a monastery, to a um, um, Buddhist monastery, I think. And he, he want to make a meeting, organize a meeting, to, to, to show the consequence in the brain of the prayer. Because he suspected there are physical consequences in the brain. So I think the psychology could be maybe may open for this. There are clear, I mean, you find neurological correlates of meditation, of prayer. 
but it doesn't make a difference which technique you use. It's only a technique, it's not a method of prayer. So whether it's a rosary or Om Mani Padme Hum or whatever mantra it would be, brain-wise, biologically, it looks all the same. And if you listen to very nice, you know, Mozart, whatever, even if you listen to secular music, it's also very soothing for the brain and so on. Yeah? But once again, we are still talking biology or neurobiology. When we talk about prayer, we don't talk about it. And uh, yes, if you look at a place like this, obviously humanity, there are very good psychologists and people know how to erect a building. But the question is not how you do it. The question is why you do it. And if you're a believer, the why is much more important than the how. I mean, there are many religious cults who are, I mean, which are based on fraud. And we now know because many of them have debunked. Yeah? But the songs they use, they're extremely, they get you emotionally involved, they're very relaxing. Yeah? But the why, why do you do it? Who do you pray to? What do you adore? What do you worship? Yeah? That's the question, which is, I think it's not an innocent question. And if we are true, I mean, if we are moral psychologists, we can't say, yeah, it's one as good as the other, because it is not. Yeah? And that's also not why, but I mentioned in the beginning, good feelings are worth really nothing. You, I mean, they're wonderful. When they come, celebrate them. Yeah? But they are fleeting guests, number one. And number two, they won't tell you why. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking as a Catholic now, sin, one reason why it's so attractive is because it gives you wonderful feeling. But it's not, that's not everything. It's good to know, and psychologically we can explain it, biologically, neural, whatever, on many layers we can explain it. But the mind is not everything. Yeah? Our human mind is not everything. And I think that's why the question is far more co complex um, and why I, in the end, think the psychologist can only lead one to the door and say, from here on, truth must take over, philosophy, analytics, you know, theology must take over, revelation must take over. Yeah? I hope. Monsignor Marcelo, you're asking the elephant in the room question. In the formative moment of what we now understand as the social sciences, religion was at the very, very center field of study. The father of American psychology, William James, uh, Freud, uh, Moses, and uh, monotheism. Uh, uh, um, Totem and Taboo, um, Max Weber, the father of sociology, Emile Durkheim, the father of French sociology, all had religion at the center of the proper study of the discipline. If the social sciences today, uh, Marx, uh, of course, uh, the opiate of the masses, it's now the topic, uh, proper topic of the social sciences is to avoid talking about religion. So this is the impolite question that you're asking. It's the impolite question. But I have a question for, if I may, very, very quickly, for uh, Monsignor Roland. I, uh, your paper was um, exquisite, uh, very pithy, uh, very clear, very um, French, if I can say the, put it this way. But I have a question for you because um, I am now, I'll read you a little thing from this is the most recent issue of Nature, the journal Nature. And it, the lead story is China clamps down on research ethics. China's powerful state council is calling on research institutions to expand and improve their ethics training. This flows from the so-called CRISP baby, right? Four years ago, two Chinese scientists created these CRISP babies, which are um, genetically alter human baby. So the issue you, uh, you talk about 
uh, artificial um, uh, insemination, fertility, and so on and so forth. We are now, Monsignor, in a brave new world, what the Alto Sacri called the brave new world 2.0. And what the, what we, what's unfolding is the speed at which science is advancing is supersonic. Ethics is geologic. So I have a question for Monsignor, for the, our two Monsignors. Have we convened a gathering of ethicists and scientists from the other academy to address this issue? Because the die is cast. This is Brave New World 2.0. And artificial insemination, this is um, Jurassic problems now, problems from the Jurassic era. The new problem will be extraordinarily more complex. This is a nice question, <laughs> but who can give you a, an answer? Uh, one point, I, certainly meetings between ethicists and scientists exist, but what is the result? Uh, can, we, um, can, it, can a new ethic come out of it? In our view, in our view, maybe in 20 years, humanity will not be as we are. But the way in, we, in which we reflect is that our ethics is really linked with our being. Uh, it, it does not come from outside. It is inscribed in us. The ethical requirements of the human being are inside of us. And the, all the work of the ethicist is to help to discern, to from it out, to bring it out, to express it. Otherwise, we are in the, in the relation of the powerful and the weak. And the powerful will always impose to you his ethic, because it, uh, it's comfortable for him. But this is not ethic. This is just uh, a human... Uh, domination of the, the, the one on the other. So, as you said, uh, at, at full speed, uh, these uh, biological and other researches are progressing and fabricating maybe something which looks like a human being. A brave new world. Uh, I think we reject it totally. <laughs> I cannot accompany this project and say in which sense we can, we can accept it. The very idea that a human being is not given, is not received at, as a gift, as a gift from the Creator. Because, as you said, if we eliminate religion or the reference to a Creator in the, in the question of, uh, of breeding human beings, of educating human beings, then we are in the real in the situation of domination of the of the powerful to the weak to the weakest, and this is what may happen. We are going to fabricate humanity with brains uh, connected to internet or to any net you wish. But are, are these as persons or individuals? Human beings, a human being is something fragile, fragile. But, uh, you know, what totally disappears from the discussion is the notion of spirit. Spirit. Uh, Alexander just mentioned the mind. Our scientists are very, very clever to analyze the mind, but the, the, the mind is linked to our brain and had a material basis. But the spirit has no material base. The spirit is something else. And the spirit is what makes us human beings. Uh, the, uh, uh, also animals, uh, superior kinds of animals, have, brain, have brains and maybe minds and behave 
in a way which we admire, but maybe they have, have not, not the spirit. And the spirit is, we cannot locate the spirit in us. We can locate the, the brain and all, all the stuff. But the spirit is what we um, grasp from outside of us. I think all the question of humanizing a, 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 of, of culture, it comes from outside. The, the, the ethics um, in each person are made out of the influence a person has received during his life, in his family and, and elsewhere. And those who believe in God, and this is why we insist so much on the sacrament of confirmation received, the spirit of God. And uh, oh, being a Christian is living according to the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is not, uh, does not eliminate my freedom, my spirit. It, it comes in dialogue with it and helps me to, to live progressively according to the, the, the message of, of, of Christ and so on. And so the spirit is what is at stake. If we, name, if we say the spirit, we are materialists. Without the spirit, we are materialists. We say the mind, which is extremely brilliant, is a result of uh, our brain. And this is biological. But the human being is more than his brain and his mind. It is also a question of language. For instance, in French, in French, we would have not two words for mind and spirit. We say l'esprit, but it is very different. It is, the one is given with biology, the other is given by the gift of God. Uh, uh, we participate in the spirit. Now I tell, tell you another thing, and this would be interesting to have a uh, um, discussion with the scientists. Uh, I read some scientists, some um, uh, phys physicists, who say all the research on the, uh, the, the universe leads to, uh, to, con to, to, to say behind all this material reality, there is a spiritual reality. This is, I do not say that for myself. I, I have read it in some scientists. Uh, that means that behind this extraordinary world in expansion with all the galaxies and, and stars, and, and, and uh, what does that mean, all that? Behind that, there is isn't it uh, a spirit. There is the spirit. And this should be deep. And this is... a. a what makes could save our humanity from uh, being reduced to uh, our uh, biological uh, or physiological um, determination? Because the spirit is freedom. The spirit, the spirit is freedom. So the spirit, I can say, okay, I I give up everything because I want to give my life to something which makes sense, which gives sense to my. And this is the spirit. This is not your, is the mind or the... And look, in St. Paul's, it's exactly that. St. Paul's, you have the flesh, the flesh, the sax, and the spirit. We, we do not speak of the spirit. Maybe uh, that what we are doing, in fact, our research is, is pushed by the spirit. <laughs> but you should uh, elaborate on what the importance of the spirit in our human constitution and for the future of the world. Because if we say nothing, we will leave all this um, um, uh, pseudo scientists fabricate a humanity which is not human. Because I have forgotten that the, the, the core of humanity is not our biological being. They work on that and transform it. But it is our biological being is a 
a receptor, a receiver of the spirit. Without tranquility, things to continue. Uh, but I want to ask that in our Academy of Sciences, we don't, we don't have this idea of, of evolution, of materialistic evolution. Uh, Coppens, as I say, and you quoted, uh, quoted the, the case of, of Lisi, and uh, here he said the, the, the new is that we have a different soul. The, the different soul of the of the of the superior also mammifer. We have an, an soul that spiritual soul because we we can suppose that for the things that we see that these people pray not in the, not as a Benedictine pray but what is pray in this case as a consciousness that we have a being and superior being that we can ask to help us. The idea of the providence in them exists. God and his providence in a, in a, in a very elemental way, but <laughs> it's present. So that's of the, of the, of the, of the beginning of, of the human being. And this is the idea that comes from sciences. So this idea that we are, the origin is the chaos, and we are a um, product of evolution and only material it's an idea that came from the economies to control the world, the dictatorship of the money, say Pope Francis. And this is, this is the ideology that they want to impose on us to, to, be, to be controlled, to, uh, to, to be against to the, the human dignity uh, in all the sense. So the real question is not to be slave of this mentality that is not scientific, it's nothing. It's a mentality used for the people to want to have this and to produce the war. What is the, the meaning of this war? <laughs> to have power. This, what is the question? This is the real thing. So I think that we need just uh, uh, in, in, in the basis of science to defend our dignity and it's proved also by science. Of course, the science can say, we can demonstrate, the, the, science, the natural sciences can say that we can have a demonstration of the soul. This is a philosophical question. But we need to accept it. other positions that are not the positivistic, but the realistic position. So in this sense, we are postmodern in the sense that we anticipate the future because it's clear that the line of the history also is not a deterministic line. The, 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 the history changed in a surprising way completely. Look the case of John Paul II. One can think that John Paul II changed all the, the course of the history. <laughs> and this was a real thing. And today we also change with this war. But we can have a new completely change in another direction <laughs> because we, we, don't, we are free. And, and, and we, they, we need to take our responsibility. This is the question. So no, it's not that we are in the, in the Eurasian epoch, as you say. We are in the future, <laughs> not in the past. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I, and I, I just want to say, Monsignor, I, your, your comments, I thought, were very important about spirit. Oh that that's what we are fundamentally. And I'm reminded of what St. Augustine said, God is deeper in me than I am to myself. And so we kind of have to move away from this idea of uh, there's me and then there's God. We're, two, we're not entirely separate. And I, I think we were talking about prayer earlier and, and families. For me, the prayer is about finding uh, what's best in myself. Because it what's deepest in myself is God, and that's where the good is. And so prayer kind of connects us with that. And that's why maybe it's good for families to find ways of praying together. OK, I couldn't resist that comment. Uh, but we do have a few people on the list. And so I can just tell you uh, who we have. We have uh, Anna Marta, we have Sister Helen, and we have Cardinal Turkson here, Paolo. Um, OK, and even one more. So I think we just start. Um, uh, start with Anna Marta, but everyone now, please try to keep it, you know, brief, so we can all speak. 
Yes, I will be very brief. Uh, it's related to this uh, last discussion. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Pope Benedict uh, 15, 15 uh, Caritas in Veritate. He speaks of technocracy at some point. And he includes the idea of reducing the soul to the psyche in a very uh, psychologistic way and also medicalized way. So I was going to ask um, about these directions, medicalization of the soul and psychologization of, of the soul. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, well, it's okay, that's enough. No, please. Sit on, yes. Thank you very much for the, I think these two uh, inputs are very much related. I mean, I, I now speak as, as a university professor. Uh, there's a war going on on the image of man. And the question of physicalism or materialism or biologism or the medicalization, yeah, it is, it is a huge problem. But I should say that um, within the philosophy of mind, which is basically, or even the psychology of mind, the understanding that a blunt, primitive materialism doesn't work is gaining much more momentum. If you, if you went to a philosophy of mind congress 10 years ago, there was Dennett and other people talking about, yeah, there was this hurrah, we are going to eliminate the soul. Nowadays, the bend is much more towards idealism, which is also an extreme. Basically, everything is an idea, and you know, matter is an outcome of but so it is going on. The, the problem is that in the public, in the popular newspapers, we are hearing a very blunt and popular vulgar materialism. Like if I think about mathematics, this flash goes in my head and this brain area is, and so on. And from there on we conclude, and therefore it is nothing but. And that's the language of reductionism. But in the history of science, it never worked. Reductionism never worked. I mean, it only worked for a few things about, about uh, the ether theory and so on, but very rarely did it work. And the further we went, the more we understood the, the phenomenon is, we are not a phenomenon, but anyway, we are much more complex than that which we can capture with biology, number one. Number two, but there's also the, uh, the seductiveness of not reducing things, when it comes to mental disorders, like the psychosis, many of them do have indeed a physiological origin, or at least it is the, the, the place where you will try to do your repair work. So medicine is important. I, I would not say, you know, non-reductionism means I value my body, I value my spirit, my mind and my soul, all of it, because that's the whole of creation. I can't, I can't take any of these away. It would all be reductionism. Sister Helen. Thank you very much. Um, I started off thinking about some of the things that you were saying, Alexander, and also remembering about what Mariana said about her two children, that they are terrified about the future. I think we should keep in mind this, this generation as well as we're talking. Um, but it also connects a bit with some of the other things people have said in, in, the, in the meantime, so I'd like to make some other connections as well. Um, it was very interesting to me the way you were talking about the why questions, the purpose questions, um, because obviously that will naturally lead us to connect with the religion and, and so the faith and, and social sciences connection there. But also I think it's a really profound issue in general for our society today. My way of thinking about it is that we're coming out of a 250-year <laughs> synthesis that was more or less fixed in the 1700s, where because of a whole series of important factors at that time, some of which were very important, they weren't all bad, but some of them were not good. But anyway, a complicated set of factors. The basic agreement was we don't talk about the goals or purpose of life, we, we push them to the private sphere, and we then talk about the means that we need to achieve these. So of course, very, very easily, we get to a situation where the social sciences are not talking about religion, and also we get to a situation where economics dominates. You know, e even today, politicians are judged by how much GDP goes up while they're in, they're in there, not on much else, you know. 
um, because the means become the center of our public discourse. Um, and what we're seeing now is we can't deal with our problems today using this synthesis. Just as the Enlightenment thinkers had their own problems, perhaps social systems were too powerful, perhaps they needed to get out. You know, I don't want to really make any comments about that. I'm not a historian of that period. But all I can say is their synthesis doesn't work for us. And we have to bring in this discussion about purpose, about the why. And it has to become part of our academic discourse as well. And that's where the faith and the religious traditions can help us as a resource to help us rediscover it, I think. You know, I work mostly with economic institutions. And the big issue now for them now is purpose. They all want to talk about purpose. It's partly because of sustainable development goals, because of all these things they know they have to think about this. And, and so, you know, we talk to them about how your purpose should be founded on promoting human dignity mm. and contributing to the common good. And they, they start doing it. They start doing it. They want to do it. Um, another thing that's very interesting is you, if you ask them to think about their history, yeah, um, this I think connects a lot with the discussion about the family. If you look at any of these big companies that, that are do, you know, become very disconnected from what's going on in the real world, you go back to their founding moment, almost always there was some need they wanted to serve, some, oh, thank you, some, something important to do, some purpose, you know, that they were set up to serve. So I think this, and the other thing I would say is this use of language. Um, I think it's wonderful to see in a paper written by a psychologist the use of the word mercy. You know, when you think about the importance of that word, you know, really the works of mercy, you know, divine mercy. We had that year of mercy. We had, you know, the, 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 the Sister Faustina's thing about, you know, I mean, it could go on and on and on and on. It's, it's wonderful to see that. So I think using that language in the scientific mm. discipline, which opens us up in a non-aggressive way, I mean, people can do what they want with it, you know, but it, it's allowing these resources from the religious traditions to enter into our thinking. And I think that could be a very kind of non-threatening um, way for people to sort of be opened up to this and just see where we can go with it, you know, and that, that kind of thing. I think we're pushing against an open door in terms of bringing purpose back in, bringing, bringing the why questions back in. And, and I hope that this could help the young people as well, to help them to deal with this fear about, but because I think that it's it's not knowing, it's not being able to talk about these kinds of these issues as well. The other thing I would say is, re, I really do think we have to take the climate change thing really, really seriously, and I think it will be very, very helpful to us dealing with the kinds of problems that that uh, Monsignor Minerat started talking about. That we we. Um, we have to start thinking about the nature of things. You know, we can't keep on treating the environment just the way we want to, based on our individual. We have to think about it the way it is. That is going to affect the way we think about it. It's, we've got a big fight on, as you were just talking about there. It's not going to happen quickly. It's going to be very complicated and very, pro but it's going to gradually have an effect. And if we have hope and if we have trust and we just keep, it will gradually start to impact. So um, I think this is this is so, and it relates so much to the relational um, issue as well. You know, economic ecological systems are relational systems, so it's going to help us bring the relational view into our our thinking as well. So anyway, thank you very much, um, Cardinal Turkson. I wanted to say <laughs> no, no. Oh, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Was basically, I think, it was it was it was in connection with uh, your your asking whether you know the issue of ethics and whatever was being studied. I just wanted to observe that there's been an ongoing dialogue for years. This is something you know, but they call the Minerva dialogue or whatever, which is an you know, ongoing dialogue between some guys from here and guys from Silicon Valley about the need to, to guide artificial intelligence and research with some ethical considerations and all. 
So this has been it's still ongoing. The COVID stalled it a little bit, but this is a, an initiative that's already been ongoing for a while. And early this year, uh, we got an invitation from a professor from uh, Columbia University, which uh, passed over to us, Monsignor Sanchez, uh, who, who invited us. We could only do a little bit of a Zoom with two members of the Academy of the Sciences on the, the application of technology to the human brain. Okay, and he, you know, he uh, thought that this was something worth looking at. And in fact, the suggestion is that the Academy of the Sciences would devote or dedicate a discussion on that issue uh, because he thought that the human brain so, is so crucial for the body that if technology got in there and was, you know, uh, applied anyhow to the human brain, we probably had a lot of Frankensteins around and, and things like that. So there is that call for accompaniment. We call it just accompaniment of ethical considerations to uh, this area of research and all. But the challenge of artificial intelligence, of course, you know, is, is there. Uh, as for the question of um, uh, no, the human soul system, uh, they, they, they've all weighed in on it. I think it's, it, it is a, there's a basic recurring question about quid est homo. What is, so it's a basic anthropological question. What is the human person? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question which is now called for only by our discussion here. It's also been called for even the area of economics and finance and all of that, investment and everything. They, they need every now and then to, to, to remind ourselves about you know, the human person and what it is. Uh, following all of these trends, of course, we've gradually followed how finance has been taken out of economics and it's become a science in itself. And a few things keep being pulled out for you know, such studies and purposes and they merit, they merit our, you know, our constant you know, guidance and attention so that we still try to, not to control, but to follow everything that is happening. Just for the well-being and for the spiritual issues, the theologians have addressed it and had, <laughs> we want to get to it less. It becomes the, the, the clerics protecting the soul or arguing for the soul. But uh, it's, it's just to assure you that there is a dialogue that's going on between ethics and artificial intelligence. And it's about, you know, between some of these top guys from Silicon Valley and guys from over here. <laughs> Pierre Paolo. Oh, sorry. Is it? No. You, uh, you recall, you had two guys from the Academy of the Sciences join the Zoom on the application of technology to a human brain. And they hope to you know, do some more of that stuff. We, we did a whole conference on that topic here a couple of years ago. Yeah, on art, you know, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, and humanity, looking at it from different angles. But I think that could be a great, the, the, so much is happening and it's moving very quickly. I, I could be a, a very good topic for one of our plenaries. Uh, so, Pierre Paolo? Yes, may I recall that uh, we had uh, the, this academy two uh, meetings, two conferences, one on the human person, what is the human person, and another one on uh, uh, new technologies and how they affect uh, the human being. Now, my uh, question is to um, uh, Monsignor Minerat. Uh, uh, I liked very much uh, what you said about uh, uh, the different, uh, uh, let's say, aspects uh, composing the human person, I mean, brain, uh, mind, uh, and spirit. Okay. Now, the, the question uh, is... Yeah. yeah, of course, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Now, the question is precisely about the two notions of spirit and soul. Are they identical, or is there a difference? Because 
For instance, Monsignor Marcello speaks about spirit and soul as the same thing. No. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, this is according to St. Thomas Aquinas, okay. okay. That we have a soul, incorruptible soul, that this is the inference of the soul of the animal, that have also soul, and a spiritual soul, but not incorruptible soul. This is the inference. The question of the, of the spirit is, is a question that put the modern philosophy to make the distinction with the human being, uh, especially Hegel and Kant and, and, and also the French people, Descartes. And this is the question. Clarification, because many times the spiritual spirit and the soul uh, are uh, confused together. A comment to Monsignor Mineras. It concerns about uh, how uh, can we as Christians uh, qualify the, the concept of spirit. Um, as you know, uh, a very famous uh, anthropologist and uh, sociologist, uh, I mean a French uh, anthropologist, uh, uh, Marcel Moss, uh, talked about the spirit of the gift. And uh, it is called in the Polynesian uh, populations, how. The how is the spirit of the circulation of gifts. Uh, a gives a, a gift to B, B gives a gift to C, to D, and then the gift comes back to the original donor. And this, in this circulation of gifts, uh, there is a spirit which is called by that population in their culture, how. Now, they act uh, in accordance as a kind of obligation towards the how, the spirit. Now, uh, I suppose it is different from your concept, the Christian concept of spirit, but in that sense, my question is, how can we qualify the difference between the different notions of spirit? Yes, may I, may I <clears throat> come back to St. Paul, which developed very much the anthropology of body, soul, spirit. Soul and spirit go always together. Pardon, pardon. Soul and, soul and body go always together. What does it mean to soul? The soul is the, the principle of animation of my body. Uh, so you can, the, the biblical anthropology is always compact. It never speaks of a, of a soul which would be eternal or so like Plato. No. Uh, the human being is made of body and, and, and soul. You can speak of the whole of the human being from the perspective of the body or from the perspective of the, uh, the, 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 the spirit, which is the psyche. psyche. But... <clears throat> Now comes the question of Neuma, Neuma the spirit. Uh, Paul has a very enlightening uh, passa passa passage in, uh, I think it is um, 1 Corinthians 12, when he speaks of the gifts of the spirit, charismata. And then he, he clarifies very much. You have received a gift of the spirit. How can you transmit it? How can you communicate this? And he says, you can communicate only what you have received, and which is extraordinary because it, it, it comes from, from above, from God, through the noose, that means through intelligence. Only through my discourse, through my discourse, I can try to clarify what happened in me when I received the Spirit. And this is wonderful, because it shows 
that the spirit goes beyond, goes beyond our uh, bodily uh, structure. <laughs> our uh, uh, Paul, Saint Paul calls it sax, the flesh, yeah, the, the flesh. And this condition is mortal. The, the mortal condition of the human being is flesh. But the spiritual is the beginning of eternal life in me. Uh, to the extent that the poet says, at the end we will have a spiritual body. We must not confuse the body with the molecules of our body. The molecules of our body will disappear, will become nothing. Once the, the, once the soul is separated from my body, my body is not longer a body. It is a corpse. And here and is always a question of language. In French, we have only one word uh, uh, for, for that. In German, a, a body which is dead is a leiche, leiche, a cadaver, a cadaver. But we say a corps. Uh, this is not correct. When we are dead, our body does no longer exist. What a Yes, what exists are the, the components of our body. But I am my body, and I am my soul. And this is together, and is called to be transformed by the Spirit. And the gift of the Spirit begins with, with baptism, begins in our life. And, and I, I'm very much impressed by what Paul says on we will end up as a spiritual body. That means our being will be transformed by the spirit, like the body of the risen Jesus. And this is essential to 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 dig to 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 to, to study these questions because it is how, what about we are, and uh, uh, and what about we are called to be. So. Um, the, the question of language is very important. When we translate words like those who said uh, into spirit, what does it mean? You know, uh, it is very difficult to have a common concept, a common linguistic concept for very different things. Marcelo? Thank you. I completely agree with Monsignor Minera and the fantastic explanation. But I want to say also, this is the Holy Spirit. This gift comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Trinity. And this is another thing. <laughs> but we can participate with this gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is another. <laughs> but gaze, in, in German, gaze. All the philosophy of gaze, uh, Hegel, etc. This is another question. This is human. And we can say, for analogy, that we have a spirit of the people, the spirit of the people, because there are costumes, there are a mentality. Of course, the gaze of the Italian is different from the gaze of the, of the German. Uh, the gaze of the Argentinian <laughs> is different of the other. So there are the four gaze that say Hegel. And this is, uh, we can say, is not properly and substance reality, <laughs> maybe it's a relation, maybe, maybe. Thank you. It, it, our, 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 our time is basically up, but I wanted to come with a comment, if, if, if I could, and then um, you, can, you, you, you go first, and then I'll come. According to St. Paul, to the New Testament, there are different spirits. We speak the spirit of God, which makes us free, which makes us uh, full of in our in our humanity, and the spirit of evil, the spirit of evil. And we have a, a wonderful document of the early church, with the end very early, uh, the Didache, Didache, uh, which is the instruction of the two ways: the spirit of God and the spirit of. of Ill or of evil or uh, yeah, 
of all things which and, and, and the human being is constantly called by two different spirits. The one which is the one which is the condition of the carnal of flesh of the, brings us to all, all disasters and the spirit of God liberates us and brings us yes I think it's fantastic that we've had this conversation in an academy of social sciences uh, yes and if if I could come if I could come with my two cents uh, the medievals operated with a, a, a notion that they called spiritual creatures right so and there were two kinds of spiritual creatures. There are human beings, and then there are angels. Uh, and I mention this because, the, uh, in a way, we should distinguish soul and spirit. And I think that you know, you explain why. On the other hand, soul and spirit, the human soul, what's characteristic of it is it is a spirit, right? It's a non-material something. Uh, and what I find really intriguing in Thomas Aquinas' account is he, he says that what's characteristic of spirit is it can't come into existence by any other way than a direct creative act of God. Right? All other things, material things, come into being through the, you know, the, the secondary causes. Ultimately, they derive from God. But there's something special about the human soul that it, it can only have a divine source. That's why God is deeper to myself than I am, deeper in myself than I am, than I am to myself. All right, but I think we've merited uh, dinner, so uh, <laughs> we'll go there now.